So hi everyone, my name is Valerie Wynn. I'm the marketing coordinator for Eagle Dream Technologies. So uh, welcome to 20 Minute Tech Break. We are here every other Friday. This is gonna be one of our last ones. We do have one more. Um, this week we'll be talking about how Crossworker is evolving the future of financial services, cloud-based solutions. Um, so if this is your first time here, this is how today's gonna go. We have 20 minutes, four questions, and two experts. So um, leading into that, one of our experts, Scott Weber, please feel free to introduce yourself. Give us a little bit of background on who you are and what you do. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to be here again. I'm the Vice President of Cloud Solutions here at Eagle Dream Technologies. Uh, I work with our sales teams and our internal technical teams to uh, introduce the AWS Cloud and what it can mean for customers, help customers find their specific uh, journey into AWS and on AWS and lead technical direction with a group of solution architects that help our, help our customers on the overall direction. Um, and I guess uh, I'm the other person on this. So uh, Jesse Onigberg, I'm a technology chief of staff at, at Cross River. Um, you know, my job is really to, you know, think about the overall technology strategy at the bank, um, you know, help kind of drive the execution and support our development and leadership teams in terms of, you know, what we're trying to get done and, and how we make sure we do it most effectively. Yep. So Jesse, we're really appreciative that you're, you're joining us today. Um, you know, you and I have a, a couple year history of working together with a couple different institutions. So we're excited to be able to have this discussion with you. Um, so Valerie, should we jump right into what the questions are? So, Jesse, you know, from, from the role that you, you've had in multiple organizations now, um, how do you see the future of banking and the cloud coming together? Um, you know, I think that it's, uh, you know, in many ways, um, community bank has always kind of been in the cloud. Um, it, we just didn't think about it that way, right? So when a community bank uses a service from Fiserv or uses a service from FIS or uses a service from Jack Henry, you know, in many ways, it's, it's a very much akin to what we call cloud computing now, right? You know, it's a service provider that provides an aggregate service to a bunch of different customers um, in a safe and secure way. And so what I think a lot of community bankers and especially on the technology side are starting to embrace is, is really if we can live with the analogy on the core vendor side, we really can get comfortable with it on the core infrastructure side. And so, um, you know, I, I see a, a continuing deepening reliance on the, the major cloud providers, um, you know, both from a ability to provide services and scale above and beyond what we could traditionally provide ourselves with, if, um, you know, with budget constraints, as well as from a ability to really do interesting things and support, you know, compelling initiatives at a scale that's relative to, you know, our, our business size, right? You know, we certainly couldn't make the level of investments to achieve the, uh, the scale and uh, scope that an AWS has to offer with our current, you know, constraints. So in some ways it can almost be a competitive advantage, right? That you may enable those smaller banks to move quicker, be more agile. Oh, a hundred percent. I think that, um, you know, if you think about cross river and, and certainly we're working with you in terms of helping us move into, you know, certain workloads into AWS that we really believe that our ability to provide services at scale is part of what makes us different. And, you know, we're certainly known for being API enabled and, and a lot of interesting things in terms of payments, but all of that really depends on a really robust and reliable infrastructure. And that we think that the cloud is, is probably the, the best way to support our, our kind of most important products. Okay. So Jesse, tell us a little bit more about CrossRiver. I mean, I, I know it because I've been, been working with you, you know, on, on helping your organization's journey, but talk to us a little bit about how CrossRiver is a little bit different and than other traditional banking and and why the cloud you know you guys feel the cloud is is pretty critical to your path so um you know cross river is kind of known for being a, a technology oriented bank and in many ways we're as much a technology company as a as a bank and you know there's been a history of people who have helped mature our offering and and continue to help define you know what we believe the future of of digitally enabled community banking is but the key to that is ensuring robust and reliable delivery 
along with safe and safety and security that banks, you know, and the trust that is, is kind of comes along with being a bank. And so we really see that what we do in terms of delivering innovative technology that relies on, on the core banking infrastructure and really gives access to the core banking infrastructure in a fundamentally different way um, is, is what the future of community banking looks like. We also believe the future uh, of banking delivery is going to be on you know, clouds, right? Um, the, uh, it's very difficult for us to deliver the breadth and depth of what we do without having the flexibility either in a private cloud or in a public cloud to scale, um, you know, as our customer demands increase. Okay. Now that makes good sense. So Jesse, this is actually the second company or second bank that I've worked with you with around, you know, a cloud initiative. So can you, can you help the audience understand, like, how do you approach the idea or, or sell the idea of cloud internally to something that's as heavily regulated, you know, and typically risk adverse as, as a banking institution? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I'd like to say that I'm just that good, but it's, it's probably not the case, right? That the, the reality of it is like anything else, you have to build partnerships and you have to create baselines. And so I think that, you know, how I started out the conversation that we're comfortable with people like Jack Henry or FIS or Fiserv providing as a service provider. And as we think about that analogy and we extend it, it's a very logical way to get the other stakeholders, you know, understanding, you know, what it is, right? It's not something big and scary. It's really saying, all right, well, we're going to go and we're going to take this model and apply it to some other things. Um, and then the other piece of it that's equally important is, you know, making sure that you embrace the tooling that AWS or, you know, some of the other public clouds, and I think AWS is probably the most mature with it, offer in terms of really robust compliance with, you know, security standards, making sure that your environments are properly hardened, taking a crawl, walk, run approach. So, you know, Scott, you know, the, the two times that we've worked with Eagle Dream, that we've taken a very deliberate approach with starting with non-production environments, then scaling them up and eventually moving to production environments and not trying to, you know, do the whole thing at once, you know, right. try to do a big bang, you know, you usually end up getting hurt. Um, so we really try to be very deliberate and take our stakeholders along the journey with us. Yeah. And I, you know, that's something that we believe strongly too, is that iterative approach. Um, Big bang, should you just go bang in your face, quite frankly? Um, you know, and so we really try to, you know, help our customers understand, let's let's iterate on this. Let, let's get comfortable with some low hanging fruit systems or something that we can deliver business value uh, right away, you know, and get everybody comfortable with it. And I think that's a good lead in to our, to our fourth question here. And, and also very, very interesting because we just had a call earlier today with, with your CISO. But, you know, what considerations do you see institutions making around security compliance and storing customer data, you know, in this new world in the cloud? I mean, everybody gets nervous. There's been way too many headlines, um, you know, of, of issues. But, you know, what, what's your thought here and, and, and how, it, how is Cross River approaching this? So I think for us, you know, fundamentally banking is about trust, right? And so we take that trust that our customers put in us and for, for Cross River, it's even more challenging because it's the trust that our customers put in us and then it's the trust that their customers put in them, right? So we have kind of a, a, whole, a whole lot of trust, right? Um, and that we really take that commitment and, and the responsibility incredibly seriously. And so uh, specific to you know, the call we had earlier today, it's thinking about the stuff that the biggest and most complex financial organizations in the world do on the entirety of their environments and the cost of deploying those type of tools and then figuring out how you can get that type of benefit you know across your infrastructure that moves into the cloud at a fraction of the cost right that uh, the, the the deep benefit of moving to an aws or, or you know a cloud provider is that you're getting to leverage the expertise of their entire customer base. You're getting to leverage the products that they deploy for their entire customer base. The, the challenge of that is really the overwhelmingness of it, right? And so, you know, 
why we, we candidly use a partner like, like Ingle Dream is specifically to help make it digestible. Mm -hmm. So in order for us to be able to connect something like, you know, the, the a standards, whether it's a PCI or CSI or, you know, however you want to alphabet soup it, that we're able to take those standards and then with your help, make sure that we're aligned against them. And as we go through this crawl, walk, run process, we're moving very deliberately and aligned against that. And so when a regulator comes in or an auditor comes in or um, you know, even our internal compliance team come in and, and challenge us and want to understand you know, what we're doing or how we're doing and how we're being thoughtful and deliberate, um, we're able to answer those questions and, and not just say that we're meeting the minimum, but thanks to some of the advanced features and functionality that are available, really really say how we're, we're exceeding the minimum, right? And, and we're doing, you know, what the, the largest institutions in the world do um, while we're a, you know, a community bank that with a couple hundred employees. Um, right. And so I think that the, the net of it is that this journey is a really, really allowing us to um, punch uh, above our weight class and, you know, service customers, you know, that are, you know, incredibly important to the, the fundamental, you know, FinTech ecosystem. Yeah. I mean, I, I sometimes characterize this as you're, you're standing on the shoulders of the giants, right? Um, I've built big data solutions for other organizations and you really start to realize what one person thinks is big data really isn't big data when you look at what, what people are doing. And, and, but you're able to do that for an organization at the same way that the, these, these larger organizations, you know, whether it's Capital One or whomever might be doing something in AWS, you have access to that exact same tool set. So it, it does start to really le level the playing field and allow you as an organization to take all these things that the cloud provider is giving you so that now you can focus not, you're, you're still going to focus on the security and compliance, but they're giving you a lot of tools that are just there natively so that now your focus can be much more on business value, I think is what we see some of our enabling for some of our customers. Yeah. And I think that, beyond that, you know, and, and kind of coming maybe back to the, the first question, right, the future of community banking in the cloud, that the basics of what banks are is really changing. And, and in many ways, COVID has accelerated it, right? Um, that it used to be that all of your value was created around your, your kind of legacy technology providers, right? You know, you used a, a you know, one of the big three um, for the vast majority of your platform, and maybe you threw in a Q2 or someone or Backbase or someone like that for a fancy front end, right? Um, right now, your customers are demanding more and different, right? You know, there's there's people who are on our team who help set up, you know, push to card and, and engage, you know, some of the, the largest clients in the in the world to help drive value for them. And that that is very little to do with those legacy providers and very much to do with being able to tell your own story and tell your own story at scale and build tooling and solutions that meet their needs. So we absolutely think that like a Pfizer and FIS and Jack Henry are critical to community banking and they provide a, a necessary suite of services for a vast majority of banks. But where community banking is going and where you'll ultimately differentiate is your ability to provide scalable bespoke solutions to your most valued customers. And you know that's something that we think, you know, you're helping us on in terms of, of replatforming some of our applications. And it's going to be the future of, I think, you know, all community banking is going to be thinking about how you develop unique value and scale um, in conjunction with these tools that you can, you can kind of get the, the best of what is to offer at a piecemeal price. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. So um, why don't we transition and see if there's any questions from, from the audience. So um, it looks like somebody's already put one into the chat, but um, if anybody has a question, feel free to type it into the, use the chat box icon and go ahead and type it into the chat, or you can raise your hand and Valerie or Adam from Eagle Dream will call on you and you, and you can ask your question to, to myself or Jesse. But um, let me, let, let's tackle this first question that um, Courtney has put in. Um, so Jesse, in your opinion, do you think financial services as an industry is keeping pace with innovation or are they, um, slow to adopt behind what what's your feeling what are you seeing so i i think that um innovation is kind of like a a funny word because it means everything and it means nothing 
Um, you know, it's kind of like um, digital transformation, which is a word I personally loathe. Um, that I, I think that there's a lot of very interesting things happening with financial services and innovation. But where it's really happening is where people are talking to their customers and figuring out unique ways to solve their problems. You know, like the, the work that we did during the PPP, right, supporting, you know, hundreds, thousands of customers and working with fintech partnerships was, was really around identifying a need and then coming up with a bespoke solution and then kind of taking good enough and iterating it. I think that innovation in, in financial services is really going to be driven by the people who realize that good enough is sometimes good enough and that they keep evolving it with what feedback from their customers as opposed, as opposed to kind of thinking that internally they can define the perfect customer journey and that they'll get there and then that's the end of the road. In, in many ways, financial services innovation and where the, the people who are accelerating it forward get that sometimes you gotta, you know, you need to, you need to kind of get something to market and then iterate it. And that's where I think the people who are driving innovation are doing a good job. The folks that aren't doing that approach um, you know, tend to be falling behind. So I think you, it's not a, are they or aren't they? I think some are and some aren't. Okay. No, that, that's, that's good insight. So it looks like we have a couple more questions here. Um, this one's sort of a two part. Um, what approach uh, is your organization taking to make sure the platform is scalable for the future and for your customers? And then how would you recommend that, you know, maybe there's somebody that's watching this video live or sees it on, on a replay on YouTube, you know, how would you, what recommendations do you have for someone else in the industry to get, to get started? So I think that first of all, it's starting with understanding, you know, what platforms are most important to your clients and then pulling the string on them. Right. And so for us, you know, we have some platforms that do um, a tremendous number of, of ACH payments, right? And a tremendous number of wire payments. And so that's an incredibly important platform for us and for our customers. And so when we look at those and we think about, you know, our, our BCP strategy and, and how we make it scalable for the business that we see today and the business that we see coming down the road, it's pulling the string on all the way to the end point of that transaction when we hand it off to a network. Right. And so, you know, we think about what are all the different connectivity points between the customer, the cross river systems, you know, the internal cross river systems that may be doing some risk and compliance checking, you know, and, and ultimately the handoff to Federal Reserve or the clearinghouse or, or the payment networks and making sure that we think about what these single points of failure are and where the bottlenecks are. And I think that in many ways, what we try to do is not necessarily solve them all perfectly but make sure that we can handle kind of the, we keep the um, eyes on the narrowest part of the funnel and are able to handle any issues with them elegantly. So if, if a system is taking some time to digest through, you know, 100,000 ACHs that we got, we wanna make sure the clients are aware that they're in queue and it's not just, you know, in a black hole. And so a lot of the approach to scalability and availability um, is thinking about how you provide customer insight to where their transactions are or partner insight into where their transactions are or where their process is, as opposed to just saying, we're going to solve for, you know, the 99.9% .9 scale problem that may be cost prohibitive, right? And so the combination of those two things of saying, I'm going to gracefully handle a bottleneck and then I'm going to surround my platforms with things like, you know, an AWS or a cloud provider that can scale horizontally and vertically where systems allow it to, to handle it, um, you know, in a more traditional approach. So there's no easy way to do it, but it's really about thinking end to end about your systems and then understanding where the opportunity lies or where your, your greatest weaknesses are. Okay. Excellent. Uh, I think we've got one more question so far, and if we don't get any more, we'll wrap up after this one. Um, you know, when, I think, you know, the, part, the, the question is really around, you know, what does a timeline look like for, for, for cloud and, and how, can you sort of, or maybe jointly we can talk about sort of how that engagement has looked like with Eagle Dream, were we up against specific dates and trying to help you? Um, you know, do you want to, maybe take a first shot at that and then I'll, I'll sort of come in on like how we've been executing with you guys. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that what we did was it was a approach to say, we didn't start with Eagle dream and then say, we're going to go to the cloud, right. You know, that 
it was very much a conversation internally about you know where we wanted to be what the the right way to do it from a strategic standpoint was and then what are the right partners to take us there and then talk to a couple of different partners and then the one that we felt candidly um, had the best balance of tactical knowledge strategic alignment and and breadth and depth of services right so um we could have certainly gone to you know a big four consulting company and, and done a bunch of work with them but I, I kind of generally prefer someone to partner with um commiserate with the size of the institution and so you know eagle dream is a i think a, a pretty nimble shop they have a bunch of depth but you know i also can call up scott if if i have a problem and you know or john or any of the guys on the team and and get an answer and so we kind of went through the strategy side of saying, all right, well, we want to do this, went through a couple of different vendor reviews and discussions, ultimately settled on Eagle Dream. And then the engagement with them, I think, you know, Scott, you could speak to it, but we've moved pretty deliberately um, throughout the process. And it's, it's again, it's, it's against that crawl, walk, run strategy, right? So there's foundational elements that we've worked on to make sure that whatever size building you know ultimately gets put on that foundation it'll be able to stand up tall and you know um, be well defended then the next piece of that is is figuring out you know what is the first level of that building look like right and then what is the second level and third level but most importantly making sure that foundation is strong and you know i think that that's been the approach i think that probably it's been a couple of months um you know in terms of where we are there's been you know, that's including the, the COVID chaos. Um, and so I think that absent, um, you know, some of the challenges because of COVID would probably be even further along, but I, I don't think there's been any huge timeline surprises from our end. Yeah, I, I would agree with all that. I mean, one of the things that we try to do in a lot of our engagements is, is as you said, Jesse, lay that foundation. And that usually starts with two things. One is education. And the second is sort of let's understand the security and compliance things that we want to put in from day one. So that is just there so that we're not trying to add security and compliance in later, put it in first, then start to identify, you know, what is going to be the TCO of doing this activity, right? So we, we done, we've done a lot with um, a tool called cloud chomp um, that, you know, help is helping your infrastructure team understand, you know, what is it costing me to run on premises? What's it going to cost me to run into a uh, run in AWS? Um, then, um, you know, putting that other fund, put security compliance foundation in place so that we can knowingly and in a controlled way now start to put things out into the environment. So um, I think we're going to go ahead and maybe start to wrap up at, at, at this point. Um, so I think, uh, Valerie, we've got a slide about an upcoming activity, right? So um, for those of you that are interested in learning more about Eagle, uh, about AWS in general, uh, we have uh, a security and compliance immersion day next Wednesday that we, you know, welcome you to, to attend. Uh, you can just go to our website and you should be able to find the link there to go and sign up for the immersion day on Wednesday. Uh, immersion days are about a half day long activity. We're going to be talking about security and compliance tools and we'll have some hands on labs as well for you guys, for the attendees to actually go and try uh, and, and use some of these tools from AWS. So Jesse, thank you very much for making time today to, to join us on this and, and to speak to the, to the audience that's in attendance. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. And you know, it's been great working with you guys and I look forward to continuing the journey. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.